uh, I must thank uh, Hari, uh, Dr. Pawan, uh, as well as the Yashoda group of hospitals for having me here. Uh, quite spellbound by the massive IP Congress. So I'll uh, now straight away head to the topic. My topic today is uh, bronchoscopic alveolar lavage and cytobrush. So uh, basically bronchoscopic alveolar lavage was uh, introduced as a diagnostic investigational tool in the 1970s and uh, very quickly came into play as a daily routine diagnostic modality. So this slide basically shows that uh, the bowel is majorly constituted 85% by macrophages and only a small percent of lymphocytes. And as the lymphocyte counts grows and the rest of the differentials, we encounter pathology. So preparing the patient becomes the most essential part of bronchoscopy bowel uh, because without preparation, you're going to land up with complications. And essentially the most important complication is damage to the scope. So those people who have encountered damage to their bronchoscope, they very well know that preparing the patient is the key. Moderate sedation is one of the key aspects of bronchoscopy. We either use midazolam, fentanyl, and if you want a deeper sedation, you go on to propofol. So surprisingly in a survey, and uh, this was released in mid of 2018 in Lung India, 60% of the bronchoscopists in India don't practice sedation while they're doing their regular bronchoscopy, quite surprising. Local anesthesia is used as and when you go in with the bronchoscope. We either use lidocaine 2 to 4%. And in case of uh, you know, lidocaine uh, being allergic, we go to other anesthetic agents. So this is a, basically a diagrammatic representation of what a bronchoscopic lavage would look at at the alveolar level. So once you have wedged your scope at the bronchiolar level, basically you flush it. So most of the saline is going to settle down in the dependent alveoli. So we must be aware of this fact and how exactly are you going to get the best sampling in such kind of road, I mean, uh, challenges. So what teaches us best about how to wash the lung is nothing better than uh, whole lung lavage. So most of you who have come across a case of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis know that gra gravity is the best help for patients who are undergoing lavage. And apart from that, there are may many uh, centers in the world that have tried, you know, curious ventilation, chest physiotherapy, even for patients who are undergoing a whole lung lavage during uh, uh, you know, uh, for pulmonary alveolar proteinosis or other uh, pathologies. So comparing BAL techniques, there are basically two techniques. On one technique, uh, this was one which I commonly encountered when I was training up in Japan, is that uh, you, it's called the syringe technique. You push the saline in, into the working channel of the bronchoscope, and then you suck it out with the same syringe. And the other technique is when you have a wall mounted suction and uh, there, is, there happens to be no difference in the uh, return as compared to both the techniques. And however, the syringe technique helps you have better control over the pressures. Otherwise your bronchioles are going to collapse when you're going to suction out and that can cause you know, more uh, uh, trauma. So by syringing, you basically have less trauma, but on uh, basis of returns, there's not much difference. So what more the, uh, interesting than to run through a couple of illustrative cases to sh show you how BAL turns around a patient's uh, you know, management. So basically we have a 50 year old female with no known comorbidities uh, working as a farmer uh, in rural India. She has about two cows, two parakeets at home, multiple pigeon visits and presence with cough for about two months, progressive breathlessness since two months. So she's worked up for a connective tissue disorder. Connective tissue disorder is negative and the rheumatology opinion is taken. She says no evidence of CTD. So this is an x-ray. You can see very fine reticular shadows in the bilateral lower zones. And I'll just run through the CT. These are the mediastinal cuts, not much, few subtle uh, lymph nodes. And as I go through the parenchymal cuts, you'll see extensive ground glassing more on the dependent areas, subpleural sparing, and of course, a few fibrosis and early honeycombing in the lower zones. So obviously this is an SIP. So what next? So this case was discussed at our Aster ILD clinic, which was about running on for about the last two and a half years. And the CT chest was suggestive of fibrotic and SIP. 
the rheumatologist strongly felt it doesn't fit. Though we can never rule out, you know, lung dominant CTD, so we had to go ahead with a biopsy. So the biopsy was done. You see a classic NSIP pattern here in the biopsy. And subsequently, what strikes the eye of the pathologist is these giant cells. So NSIP with giant cells, you got to think twice whether this is basically idiopathic NSIP or just NSIP associated with CT ILD or something else. So obviously when you have giant cells, you're going to move more towards hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So what's the role of bronchoalveolar lavage? My intention to show you this case is how BAL, there is a rejuvenated interest in BAL in cases of interstitial lung disease or diffuse parenchymal lung disease. So once BAL was done, with a regular counter, it showed that the lymphocytes was about 50%. And the patient was diagnosed with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, started on steroids, and you can show, you can see that there is a drastic improvement in the X-ray. So, BAL is being routinely implicated in the use of diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. And the usual cutoff value we use at our institute is 30%, though the cutoff values vary at different institutes and experience. Most importantly, BAL is useful to diagnose idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis from other kinds of UIP pattern ILDs. So let's go on to the next case. Here we have a 48-year-old male with no known comorbidities, no smoking history, who's a known case of systemic hypertension on prop uh, propanol. And basically, he's been living in the same house for the last 10 years. Again, presence with dry cough since two weeks, progressive breathlessness since two weeks, He's been running fever off late for the last two days, and there's a recent history of travel. Patient presents to the ER on day one. Your ER doc calls you and says that the patient is breathless. He's on, uh, you know, quite a large amount of oxygen, six liters of oxygen. What do I do? So he does an x-ray and obviously jumps to the conclusion this is severe pneumonia. Patient gets admitted in the ICU. You have to treat him like bilateral severe pneumonia. The patient has started on cefepirazone, sulbactam, azithromycin, antivirals, and he's been initiated on non-invasive ventilation. And rest of the blood parameters speak for themselves. So I'm going to obviously think this is a case of bad infection. Now let me run through the CT because subsequently a CT was done having a high suspicion, bad pneumonia, bilateral alveolar shadows, young person. So it shows patchy consolidation bilaterally with minimal effusion on both sides. So what are we thinking at? So patient continues to deteriorate. He's on HFNC now with a flow of 60 liters, 60% FiO2, significantly breathless, related to one of the doctors who is the chief. And uh, we got to do a ball on this patient. So it's pushing us to do a high-risk bronchoscopy. So we go ahead and do a ball, and all his infective parameters come out negative. We got to need an answer, so we still wait for the cytology. The cytology turns up the next day, and as you can see, the eosinophils is pretty high. It's about 40%, so it's more than 25% eosinophils. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with a case of acute eosinophilic pneumonia, which, you know, at first instance might not strike you uh, when the case presents as a severe pneumonia at the ER. Patient was pulsed with methylprednisolone for the next three days, and you can see how marvelously the x-ray has improved, and the patient goes back walking over the next three days. So the patient comes in with severe pneumonia, walks back home in three to four days. So that's the uh, trick Baal can do for you in such pushing cases. So let me go on to the third case to elaborate on Baal. We have a 49-year-old renal allograft recipient who's basically uh, having diabetes, hypertension, and anemia as well. He presents with cough since two weeks, progressive breathlessness since two weeks, and fever since a week. He's received oral cefpodoxine for the last seven days. There's been no improvement. Again, a challenging case. He's pushing you to do something. He is sitting at four liters of oxygen, 83% at room air. So this is a chest x-ray, quite innocuous. What you see is a small right abscess in the right lower zone. What are you going to do? Obviously, you're going to start him on a whole lot of medicines because your nephrologist is at your neck. He doesn't want to lose a patient. This is a renal allograft transplant recipient. So you start him on meropenem, polymyxin, voriconazole, caspofungin as well. So we're using going all guns out. So we're not left with anything else. And on the second day, this happens. Bam! Your whole 
X-ray is flooded. I'm not sure whether it's fluid, it's infection. What is it? So obviously we do a CT scan and the CT scan shows not much of significant mediastinal lymph nodes and wow. So you have extensive alveolar shadows over one day. Obviously the patient is going into some kind of areas like picture and extensive consolidation. And right here you can see there is a small cavity in the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe. So what lies beneath? We again go ahead, push this patient into a bronchoscopy bowel. The patient is sitting on, uh, you know, HFNC. So HFNC, you know, allows us to do high-risk bronch bowel without putting the patient on intubation, especially in these kind of scenarios. And the bowel comes back as negative, both for gram stain, culture, as well as gene expert. And luckily, we find a bug to have an explanation to why the patient is deteriorating. It is PCP which was positive and the patient is started on Bactrim DS and there again. So Baal has done the magic again for you and turning over the patient in such kind of circumstances. So PCP as you know uh, is one of the organisms that has to be dealt with in uh, immunosuppressed patients on long term immunosuppressants and the usual methods of diagnosing staining PCP have you know, fail. There's a large number of data that suggests that false negative rates are pretty high. And uh, so we are coming to the era of PCRs and PCR luckily help us to differentiate colonizers from active PCP infection. So basically you're going to have a quantitative PCR that tells you whether there's a true infection or there is just a colonization as PCP is everywhere. So when not to do a ball is more important than to understand when do, to do a ball because once you encounter a patient with complications, you have your hands dyed, you have nothing much you can do. You cannot tell a patient, I did a simple procedure like bronch ball and he landed up with something else. So what are the contraindications? Extremely poor general condition within six weeks of myocardial infarction, serious arrhythmias, bleeding tendencies, as well as airway diseases which are uncontrolled. And all these things can go wrong similarly in a patient who you are trying to do ball on. So you need to be prepared before you even put the scope down his throat. So uh, coming to the uh, last couple of slides, what role does cytobrush play in today's world? Well, earlier days we used to use cytobrush extensively to get protected specimens uh, from, you know, deep down in the lungs so that you don't pick up contaminants as you push your, you know, uh, the brush out. But now we have enough data to suggest the cytobrush can be, you know, reborn again into interventional pulmonology, more so with uh, the amount of work I've seen in Japan and how they sample these peripheral nodules with the cytobrush. And to suggest that we have enough data that suggests that the yield with cytobrush is pretty high. As you can see, the odds ratio with a lesion with a positive bronchus sign as well as a within lesion is pretty high compared to without. And uh, invariably is the, uh, as we move into the new dimension of treating malignancies, uh, we need markers to understand how to treat malignancies. And is the cytobrush sufficient or even a tBNA sample sufficient to, you know, categorize this tumor? And uh, this study uh, shows that uh, patients who undergo radial EBUS uh, and, uh, you know, uh, subjected to cytobrush uh, have shown that the sample is sufficient. You know, almost 363 cases out of 376 patients were identified to have EGFR mutation just on cytobrush sampling. And so that's the end of uh, uh, this brief talk on bronchoscopy alveolar lavage and cytobrush. Thank you.